Welcome to a special episode. I would like to cover an arcade cabinet which I like very much, but I don't own myself. I reached out to DBN Poldermans, who is a vital support of the channel since the very first episodes. He volunteers at the Dutch National Video Game Museum, where they have a working unit of the particular game. The people there were so kind to allow me taking photographs and provided me some video footage, which they exclusively shot for me. While researching the game online, I stumbled over Vic Zacken, who was a treasure trove of information. Generously, he allowed me to use material from his YouTube channel. In the acknowledgement segment at the end of the video, I will go into more details on the contributions I have received. Quick and Crash was made in 1999 by Nemco. It is an electromechanical arcade game. A light emitting gun rests in a holster. A signal tells the player to draw and shoot the targets in the cabinet. A predetermined amount of shots, usually set to 20, is available for the four stages. The player tries to be as quick as possible to make it into the high score table. The game is somewhat infamous for its last target, which is a cup that appears to shatter into numerous pieces upon getting shot. People who are less familiar with the story of Namco might be irritated about Quick and Crash being an electromechanical arcade game. But Namco did in fact offer a variety of such cabinets since as early as the late 60s. Among the more famous games are Ultra Gun, Gam Deru Gun and Cosmo Gang. A single playthrough of Quick and Crash doesn't take much time at all. The first round shows a simple stationary target. The second round doubles that. In the third round, a single target is moving in the cabinet. In the last round, there are three targets. After two moving targets are hit, the ominous cup appears in the middle of the playfield. An energetic voice comments on how the player is performing during the wall game. In between stages, the achieved time is compared to the ones of previous customers. Based on that, the game forecasts how the ranking on the high scores table could end up. Similarly as I have shown in episode 204 with the Big Top Arcade Machine, Quick and Crash prolongs the perceived distance between player and targets by the use of mirrors. The play targets and the cup assembly are actually rotated 90 degrees down into the cabinet. The optical illusion of the shattering cup is achieved by hiding it under a matte black cylinder mantle, which is held under spring tension. If the cup is shot, the mantle is lowered, while pre-made cup shorts are being ejected through a little hole. The quick and crash light gun, which is labeled Revolver Mod 14N, emits very bright light towards the playfield, which is then picked up by photosensors in the targets themselves. The light source is a powerful xenon bulb inside the cabinet. The lamp isn't lit all the time, but instead flashes if the trigger is pressed. Such lamps get extremely hot and permanent illumination wouldn't be feasible. The light is then sent over a fiber optic cable into the gun, where it is re-emitted from a specific distance to a planoconvex glass lens. This distance can be varied to dial in the circumference of the shot area. The shell of the gun is very sturdy. A full-size microswitch is held in place by removable steel pins. Sadly, those pins make the gun very cumbersome to open. The pretty, bakelite-like looking resin grip plates further complicate the opening of the gun, as they have a tendency of melting onto the shell. A large metal mounting plate makes sure the support hose of the fiber optic cable is secured firmly. An external plastic port clamps onto the hose from the outside and provides additional support. In the barrel is a long weight which balances the controller very well to center. Personally, I love the visual appearance of the Mod 14N and it is among my favorite light guns of all time. I bought it to use as a light emitting gun controller just like I have shown in episode 127. Sadly, my gun lacks the rear sights, as in reality my particular gun was made for Namco's Cool Gunman cabinet, which was released a year prior to Quick and Crash. The shell was reused for the latter by drilling two holes into the top and fitting a threaded mounting plate, which allows the attachment of a slip over rear sight. 
Cool Gunman in itself is also very interesting. A can lies on a wavy surface, which consists of star-shaped petals. In the middle of each petal is a light sensor. If a petal is shot, it rocks upwards, which knocks the can around if it is close by. The target of this two players game is to guide the can into the goal of the competing player. The mod 14N went on to be reused in 2001 by another game called Bee Panic. In it, bees are shot for points to win real life prizes. When gaining 500 points, the players may choose to risk losing the prize for the chance to win a higher valued one. In 2001, a port of Quick and Crash was released for the Sony PlayStation 2 as an unlockable in Time Crisis 2. In lack of a holster, the game forces the player to keep the gun facing away from the screen and won't start the rounds otherwise. Besides the original game, there are four additional modes which are exclusive to this port. Competition is a two players only game in which the players almost play the standard game but while seeing the targets of the other player on the same field. The targets are color coded to avoid confusion. The first player to hit the cup wins. In chain hit, the player tries to hit as many targets as possible in a row without missing. Starting with hit 49, instead of a cup, other targets are being used. This mode actually has an end and shows a rotating grey plate as the final target number 255. In one shot, the player is presented two plates and the cup in a quick draw style minigame. Relevant for the score table is the best result out of any of the three rounds that take place. As the name already gives away, in the mode 10 seconds, the player is given 10 seconds to hit as many targets as possible. Having played both, the real arcade cabinet and the PS2 port, I am happy to report that much of the original appeal and fun has been captured and preserved. The addition of new play modes helps to keep the game interesting over time. The sound effects of the port are very close to the original, but the English narrator was replaced for a new one. A nice touch is that this Crick and Crash port has been localized for many new regions. While the graphics aren't overwhelming at all, especially when it comes to the animations of the spreading cup, I much appreciate the inclusion of new targets for the added play modes. This inclusion could be a nod to substitutes for the cup, which were released in Japan for the real arcade machine. We are at the end of the video and I want to acknowledge the kind support I have received. Once again I want to thank Vic Sacken and his friend Ashley who played in one scene. On his website vixamusements.com, Vix posts machine locations and scores. In a blog section he shows how to do repairs and gives further information. On his YouTube channel, Vix explains and presents lots of arcade cabinets. Many thanks go to Mitani Gusu, whose YouTube channel offers an astonishing collection of video footage of electromechanical arcade cabinets. On his Twitter page, he posts delightful photos of arcade treasures. From the people of the Dutch National Video Game Museum, I got a lot of help and without them, the video wouldn't be the same. Even after I have seen the flagship arcades of Tokyo, Japan, I still consider this museum in Zetomir to be the most magical place on earth. Special thanks go to Stefan, who did the filming, and to Frank, who played the game in the museum footage. This is the end of the review. My name is Ben. I thank you for viewing.